Ah, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship. Um, a special welcome to any who are visiting with us this morning and others who are worshipping here for the first time. Some who have met already, a warm welcome. And also this morning, I'd like to extend uh, a welcome to representatives of the Gideon Society, of Gideon International, who will be giving a presentation uh, as part of our morning worship. So I'd particularly like to worship, uh, worship to welcome to our worship Gerhardt and, and Kathy Lip, and Don and Ivana Lorenzo and John D'Alessio, who are all with us this morning. A warm, a warm welcome to you all. Church notices are, are there as printed. Uh, I just emphasize the, the study evening is on Wednesday evening in the hall at, at 7.30. Uh, last Wednesday, we looked at the story of Moses, and we continue today with our journeying into the Sinai wilderness. That's at 7.30. And as I said before, you don't need to have attended all the previous ones to come along, so uh, feel free to come along on, on Wednesday evening. Um, a thank you to the fellowship committee who had organized and carried through a, a fun afternoon, a Valentine's uh, tea. That was on Friday afternoon. The hall was, was full, and I think those who came along thoroughly enjoyed uh, the, their afternoon tea and the singing of, of uh, old and familiar songs. So thank you, to the, thank you to the fellowship committee. Thanks too to the volunteers who turned up yesterday uh, as part of our continuing restoration of the building. If you come in from this side, you'll see there's a lot of painting was done yesterday. I'm pleased to see that some of those who were involved in that have got the paint off themselves. There seemed to be as much paint going in some of them as on the walls, but thanks, thanks for all of that, that, con that uh, continuing work. And uh, two notices regarding next, next Sunday, uh, one of for which you've got a, a, a flyer, and that is the Family Praise and Pancake Supper. I know it's sort of um, anticipating the beginning of Lent, I'll show Tuesday by a couple of days, but uh, next Sunday evening at five o'clock in the hall, uh, we're going to have the children of CCY who have been learning songs over the past few weeks, so we're going to be singing some of their songs but also some familiar uh, older songs for the congregation. And if you'd like any particular requests, please let me know at the end of, our, end of our worship. And that's going to be followed by a pancake supper. Now, it's not just for the children and their, and their parents. It's for the whole congregation. And I hope as many of you as possible will come along uh, and support that evening. That's next Sunday at 5 o'clock. But prior to that, the Outreach Committee have organized a lunch for next Sunday following morning worship. That's at 12 o'clock. That's to be a spaghetti lunch. Spaghetti with an assortment of sauces, um, Caesar salad, and garlic bread. And the funds for that are for the uh, summer school, the um, school uniform program for the summer. So that's next Sunday, lunch at 12, pancakes at 5. So, you know, the good thing is you don't need to feed yourself next Sunday at all, right? It's quite heavy on carbohydrates, but uh, please come along and, and support these events as, as, as best you can. That's next Sunday. Let us worship God. Let us sing to his praise hymn 189. Be still, for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One, is here. Hymn 189. <laughs> Still for the presence of the Lord, the 
Whoever is obedient to his word, in him the love of God is truly made perfect. Let us pray. Almighty God, we gather this day to offer you our worship and our praise, to join with your whole church in heaven and on earth, to proclaim your greatness and to acknowledge you as creator and sustainer of all, of the furthest galaxies, of this planet on which we live, creator and sustainer too of our own lives. Heavenly Father, your dwelling place is eternity. And yet you dwell too in our hearts and in the life of this, your world. We acknowledge too your holiness. For holiness is part of your being, your being and your very nature. And we acknowledge too that just as you have called us here this day to worship, so too you call us to lives of holiness within your church. And yet we confess that the nature of your holiness illumines our faults and our failings. For we have not always lived as we should. We can be selfish and self-centered, concerned more for our own plans and ambitions and desires than for your will for us. And in so doing, we cause harm to ourselves and to others. And so before you now, we ask forgiveness as we ask to the patience and the forgiveness of those whom we have wronged or let down. Grant us, we pray, the assurance of that forgiveness, that we might be freed from these faults and failings and indeed guilt of the past. Help us more faithfully to follow in your ways, to take the paths down which you call us, that we may grow closer to you and so closer to one another, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would the boys and girls like to come out to the front just for a few moments? Down you come. If there are any who are new and a bit nervous, don't be worried. You can just stay where you are if you wish. Well, right, nice to see you all this morning. I think holidays have taken the toll on Sunday school, as they have in the choir this morning, holidays and flu, holidays and flu. Now, just a little game this morning we're going to play. Do you all know the game Simon Says? Do you know it? Well, you're going to have to stand up for this, right? Now, you know how it works, don't you? If Simon says, do this, you have to do it. And if it's not Simon, then you haven't. Are you ready? Simon says, arms up. Simon says, arms down, arms up. <laughs> Pretty good. Simon says, do this. Simon says, do this. Simon says, do this, do this. Whoa, very good. The game ends when you're all out. <laughs> right, one more time to see if I can, to see if I can catch you out. Simon says, do this. Simon says, do this. Do this. Oh, nearly. <laughs> nearly, but you didn't. Well done. Well done. You're all far too good at this game. Okay. It's a game that started in England, right? Tradition says it's a game that started in England. There was a man called Simon de Montfort, tradition goes, and he captures the king. He captured the king, King Henry III. And for the next year, every time King Henry III said something that Simon didn't like, if, Simon, if the king said, I want you all to do this, if Simon didn't like it, he said, no, I don't, I want you to do this instead for a whole year. And that's, I'm told, where the, where the game started. And now it's spread all over the world, to all sorts of different countries. And in a lot of countries, they still call it Simon Says, and that's how the game works. It's still Simon Says. But in other countries, they've changed it a little bit. In Holland, in Europe, it's Johnny Says, right? In, in France and in Quebec, it's Jacques Says, right? And you might know in Ireland, it's O'Grady Says, 
right? And then in some countries, they don't use a name at all. In some countries, they say, the king says, or the general says. Some countries, it's the teacher says. And in other countries, it's just the leader says. Okay, the leader says. And that's what we're going to be thinking a little bit about later in our worship today, about the leader says. And one of our stories from the Bible this morning is about a great leader in the church, in the early church, called Paul. And he was a great leader, and he tried to tell people what they should be doing and what they should not be doing. And when people in that early church were arguing a bit about who they thought the best leaders were, he taught them one very, very important thing. He said, it's not me, and it's not another man called Apollos, and it's not another man called Peter or Cephas. The leader you should listen to and follow is a man called Jesus. And that's, so when you think about leadership today, when you go off to CCY, think about your Sunday school teachers as leaders and all the nice leaders you have. But remember, the leader we all try and follow when we come to church on a Sunday morning is Jesus himself. Now we're going to sing. Today's song is 122. Are you going to help give them out? Thank you. 122. Let all the world in every corner sing. Out. Yeah. Let all the Let's remain standing for the blessing on the children. Loving God, as our children go from here, may they go with your blessing, knowing your love and your joy. In Jesus' name, amen. with us this morning, so welcome them all. Have a chance to speak to them and welcome them afterwards. Very nice to have them with us. <laughs> he, he's not new. <laughs> now, before our reading from Scripture, we're going to have a presentation on the work of the Gideon Society of Gideon International. Um, and Mr. Don Lorenzo, I think, is going to present first, and then and John D'Alessio is going to follow up. Ron, please come forward. So John is going to do the hard work, and I'm going to do the easy part. I want to tell you how pleased I am to be here and to thank Reverend Alistair for having us here today. Most of you are aware of who we are and what we do. However, for the benefit of those of you who are visiting, uh, let me just emphasize that we are an organization of Christian business and professional men. We believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. 
And we also believe, and the records would indicate, that the simple act of reading the Word of God is sometimes sufficient to make the reader aware of his need for salvation through Jesus Christ. So with our wives who form the auxiliary of the Gideons, we number worldwide just under 400,000 members. We are established in 200 countries and territories. And I'm pleased to tell Bob, who is sitting there looking at me, that I represent the Gideon's International Office here in Bermuda. We have a camp which is presided over by our president, Mr. Gerhard Lipp, and we work very effectively and efficiently to distribute the word of God to the people in this country. We serve as an arm of the local church. Gideon's are laymen. We are not pastors. We stand shoulder to shoulder as missionaries of the local churches. And we help their pastors in going to the four corners of the world to win others for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do that simply by placing Bibles in the human traffic lanes and the streams of international life. We place them everywhere that you can think. Sometimes we are amazed at the results. But I'm going to ask John to talk about that later on. Last year, we gave away 79,992,812 scriptures. And we did that in 93 languages. Would you believe there's so many languages in the world? 93 different languages. Our goal is to place 120 million scriptures annually by the year 2020. Normally at this time, I would ask you to listen to a look at a video that we would present, but I understand it's not working. So I'm going to step down and ask John to come and conclude the presentation. Good morning. It's great, to be, it's great to be back among friends. We're here to ask you for three things. We need help. The first is that we need your prayers. Specifically, we like to place to all our middle one students this pocket Bible. On many occasions, I've been dealing with teachers and principals who say, I received this when I was in middle school one, and I carried it with them to university and brought it back. By that time, I told them it was time to get a new one. <laughs> we are fortunate that we are in all government schools and three private schools. We are fortunate that we are able to distribute Bibles in almost all hotels. We have an issue which is politically correctness. And they have been told, we have been told, that we are religion-neutral schools at BHS, at Saltus, and at Summersfield, and religious-neutral hotels at the Fairmont Southampton at Elbow Beach. We need your help to be get it, able to get into those schools and into those hotels. Second, we need you, your husbands and wives, to join the Gideons to help us to distribute the word of God. As Gideons, we do not charge for any of our Bibles. We pay some, we do fundraising within our own organization, and we have been blessed with very, very generous people who have donated. The small personal one that would fit in your pocket or the students, their backpacks, costs us one dollar to make. For those like me who need the larger print, it costs us two fifty. I'm not going to say anything about the 8 a.m., but they took a lot more of the large print than they did of the pocket size. And the last is the Bible that for all of you who travel and you open the drawer right next to your bed, you will see the Bible there. And this is a Bible that we don't say leave it in the room. 
If you need to take it, you take it. Our goal is to simply replace it, to place more. At times, this year, for the last two years, we had to replace old Bibles that had been worn, and what we do is we recycle them into the prison system. So at the end of this, um, at the end of this present, at the end of this service, we will be at the doors, presenting you with small or large, and our Bibles will be open to receive any donation you wish to give. Um, thank you, Alistair. And if I could just make a very brief presentation to you. Th thank you all, and uh, rather like those who worship at 8 a.m., I might be going for the big print as well, John. So, but thank you indeed for that, for that gift. We're now going to turn to the Word of God. Our first lesson, our Old Testament lesson, is from the book of Leviticus. And you may follow along in the Bible that you'll find in the pews. first reading is from the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, and you'll find this on page 106. We'll read the first two verses and then jump to verse 9 and read to 18. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. And you shall not lie to one another. And you shall not swear falsely by my name, profaning the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not defraud your neighbor, you shall not steal, and you shall not keep for yourself the wages of a laborer until morning. You shall not revile the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. You shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And now we'll turn to the New Testament section, the first letter to the Corinthians. Chapter 3, uh, again reading the first two, or no, reading verses 10 and 11, and then jumping to 16 and reading to 23. This is on page 167 in the New Testament. Chapter 3, starting at verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. 
that foundation is Jesus Christ. And then at verse 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If you think that you are wise in this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast about human leaders, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All belong to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Amen. There's, there's no anthem this morning, so we turn to the Gospel, and the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5, and at verse 38. It's in page 5. It's a continuation of Jesus' teaching, which began with the Beatitudes and continues his teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. May God bless to us the reading of his word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. Hymn 565, My Life Flows On in Endless Song. Hymn 565.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. As I've indicated before, the, the common lectionary, as it's called, uh, common lectionary because it's shared amongst many of the denominations, but the common lectionary gives the the readings for each Sunday over a, a three-year cycle, a reading from the Old Testament, the Psalms, the Epistles, and the Gospel. And within that three-year cycle, Leviticus doesn't appear a great deal. In fact, it hardly appears uh, at all. And if you've tried to read through the book of Leviticus, you'll possibly know why. It contains a great deal of the cultic ritual laws and food laws and, and other laws which uh, were to govern the people at, at that time. And, and as such, they're not regularly preached upon. But today's reading from the book of Leviticus comes from a part of the book which is simply known as the Code of Holiness. The Code of Holiness. And it reflects the fact that as God is holy, so He calls upon His people to be a holy people. And therefore, His people individually to be holy people. Now, if you're a Scot, that immediately sends certain alarm bells uh, ringing because your mind is directed very quickly to a poem by the great Scottish poet Robert Burns called Holy Willie's Prayer. And I was deeply disappointed at the eight o'clock service to discover that nobody knew Holy Willie's Prayer. I'm not actually sure how many of them had heard of Robert Burns. But can I just ask, apart from Mike Wally up the back there, how many are familiar with Burns and Holy Willie's Prayer? Yes, we've got a few. Good, good. One or two, one or two are familiar, are familiar with, with Holy Willie's Prayer. Let me say at the, at the outset that nowadays, ever since Burns wrote the poem, if someone addresses you or suggests that you're a Holy Willie, it's not seen as a complimentary term. And, and let's look at, at some of the reasons for that. Burns wrote the poem in 1785. Um, sometimes thought he was an irreligious man, but he's not. He wasn't a religious, an irreligious man at all. But he did tend to rail against what he saw as the hypocrisy of the church at that, at that time. Some of its hypocrisy and some of its rather judgmental nature. And it was a time when what was known as sort of predestination was kind of current, which in, in a way was a sort of, uh, I think, a precisely misguided teaching on, on some of Calvin's theology. And predestination ran simply, ran simply as this, that God, if you like, had preordained, He had preordained those individuals who would end up with salvation and those individuals who would end up in the fires of hell. And this was something that was nothing, therefore, to do with, with free will or nothing to do with moral behavior. It was something simply that God had, had preordained. And see, some were ordained for salvation and some were preordained for the fires of hell. And so that was part of the background to the poem. And the other was a real case uh, of an elder in the kirk of the church in the parish of Mochlin in Ayr, where Burns lived, uh, called Willie Fisher. And Willie Fisher, by his own reckoning, clearly belonged in the category that was preordained for salvation, rather than the category that were preordained for the fires of hell. And as such, he saw it his duty to go around spying on other members of the congregation and their misdeeds, and then informing the minister so he could suitably uh, rebuke them. And one such target of his spying was one Gavin Hamilton, who was a local landowner and also the treasurer of the, of the church. And Willie Fisher decreed that this was a man who should be brought before the judgment of the minister and indeed the judgment of the presbytery. That was the local area that would look at these, at these cases. And so they were brought before the presbytery and Willie Fisher appeared with his complaint and Gavin Hamilton appeared with his counsel. And at the end of the day, Presbytery ruled in favor of Gavin Hamilton. And as such, Holy Willie went off and wrote his prayer in, the, in the, the writing of Burn Prayer. And in that prayer, 
he reflected the fact that he himself was, was not without sin. Um, he had a kind of fond eye for the lassies, the ladies of the congregation, and not just a fond eye, it has to be said. <laughs> and he, he acknowledged that in, in his prayer, but also acknowledged that how fortunate he was that because he was one of the preordained for salvation and lived by the grace of God, then that kind of you know, got him out of the predicament. But others not so. And so he suggested that God should judge severely, not just Gavin Hamilton and his council, but also the presbytery and any others who incurred Holy Willie's, Willie Fisher's wrath, Holy Willie's prayer. So you can see why nowadays to be called a Holy Willie in the Scottish concept is not seen as a complimentary term. But the call to holiness... What was the call to holiness as we read of it in that chapter, in that section from Leviticus? It was simply to, to lead lives that were just and righteous according to God's will. When the landowners brought in the harvest, leave some, leave some to be gleaned, leave some round the edges for the poor and for the landless and for any aliens or strangers in the land. When the vineyard, when the grapes were ready and to be collected, leave some for the poor, for the landless, those who, had, those who had nothing. And in your dealings and in your relationships with others, treat them with honesty and with integrity. If, you're due, if a bill is due to be paid to the workman for his labor, then pay it promptly. Don't keep him waiting so that he has nothing to fall back upon. It also suggested that no deference should be shown to the great or to the rich. But interestingly, no partiality should be shown to the poor. And what was meant by that was that in support of the poor, in coming to the aid of the poor, it should always be done in a legal context, not illegally, and should be done within the context of justice and fairness and righteousness. That's what was called upon in terms of the the code of holiness, that's what was meant when God called his people to be holy as he himself was holy. There was a sense in Willie Fisher and of a certain superiority. And when we turn to Paul's letter to the Corinthians, we see elements of that as well. This young church that Paul had started and laid the foundations of, and yet he now writes to the church, finding that there are tensions there, there are conflicts, with some saying, well, we see and we acknowledge Paul as our leadership. Others saying, we acknowledge Apollos, a young, fine preacher, skilled in rhetoric. We see Apollos as our leader. Others turn to Cephas or Peter, the rock, on whom Jesus said his church should be built. And others still it seems, said, no, we simply hold to Jesus as, as our leader. But it would seem from Paul's comments that they did so with a suspense of superiority. Superiority in the life of the church, when what's called for is instead a sense of, of humility. And sadly, we see it in the history of the church. And that history, that history has manifested itself in the many divisions which the church has seen over the centuries of its, of its history. And we look at the divisions historically and we look at the divisions within the church today and, and remember Paul's encouragement to them. Remember that you are one as the body of Christ is one. Was Christ not one person, one body? So you too are called to be one body and not divided, set against one another. It was interesting looking back on the disruption in Scotland when the, the Church of Scotland split into various denominations, the, the point was made that as these new denominations were formed, some built strategically, others built competitively, and glowered at one another across the one high street with a certain sense, too, of, of superiority. And I was reminded of a lovely illustration by the late Leslie Newbegin, who was a bishop of the, in the church in India. He had, I thought, a, a, a lovely illustration as we try to reflect, if you like, on our, our nearness to God 
and a sense of superiority that can come with that, with some seen as being maybe nearer than others. And the illustration he used was one of concentric circles. Now, I'm sure you all probably know what a concentric, concentric circles look like. If you throw a stone into a pond and the ripples spread out in, in circles, the furthest one out, concentric circles. And he used that illustration to suggest that the furthest ripple, the furthest circle, would be these philosophies, if you like, or ideologies, which could be regarded as, as atheistic, if you like, or, or humanist. And then you moved in a circle or two, and you got other world religions in terms of their closeness to God. It might be Buddhism or Hinduism or some of the other world religions. And then you moved in another set of circles, and you came to what we call the monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all religions that worship the one God rather than the plethora of gods worshipped in other religions. And then you move closer to the center still, with God, of course, near the center at the center. And as you moved in, you moved away from Judaism and, and Islam simply to, to Christianity. And within Christianity, of course, you had all the various denominations. And as you'd expect, right at the center, closest to God, the Church of Scotland. I don't really expect you to believe that. <laughs> but but it, it, it makes the point, and I say it makes the point because sometimes within denominational differences and, and indeed divisions comes with them a, a sense of superiority, of being better than another denomination, or one church being better than another church. There's no place for such superiority. There is instead a place for humility as we seek to be a holy people, that people which we are called to be and to, to work to heal the divisions which can at times separate us. And finally, when we turn to the gospel, we have these challenging words from, from Jesus. If someone strikes you on the cheek, then in the face, throw, turn the other cheek towards them. If someone asks you to walk a mile, as could happen in Jesus' time, a, a, a Roman soldier could ask a a Jewish citizen, to pick up his, his goods and carry them for a mile. And Jesus said, if you're asked to do that, then walk too. There's a sense in all of these, the, the, the love of enemies. That's a curious one, actually, because he says, you're commanded to love one another and hate your enemies. Well, in fact, there is nothing in the, in the Old Testament about hating your enemies. Yes, the command to love your neighbor as yourself, as that passage from Leviticus closed, but there was at the time among the Essene community, a sort of monastic, separate community who were around at Jesus' time. There was within them a, a commandment to, to hate evildoers. Jesus says, not to hate your enemies, but to love your enemies as you love your families and your, and your friends. What lies behind all that is this, is this simple insight. The way we behave should not be a response to the way in which we are treated. So in other words, the way you're treated, the way someone deals with you, you don't respond to them on that basis. How do you respond to them? You respond to them out of the very love and the nature of God. That is where our actions and our behavior and our way of life requires to be rooted. Not in revenge, not in response, not in a retaliation, Retaliation is something I was very, which was very familiar in my days in Melrose, which of course is the heart of rugby country. And many of the rugby players I knew lived by the maxim, get your retaliation in first. <laughs> instead, instead we're asked not to seek revenge or to retaliate on the basis of how we're being treated, but to base our behavior, to have our behavior rooted in the very love and in the nature of God. And in attempting to do that, in attempting to live in His ways and follow His Word, then we are attempting to be what we are called to be, a holy people, just as God Himself is holy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In five hundred and...
35. Who would true valor see? Let him come hither. Hymn 535. Let us offer now our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers for others. Let us pray. Almighty God, for all your gifts and blessings to us in life, for all that enriches and enhances our life, we give you thanks. We thank you for the love that we are privileged to receive, for the friendship and fellowship which supports us in our daily lives. And we give thanks too for your church and the privilege of being called to serve within that church. Called to be a holy people. Called not to be served, but to serve. Called to work for justice and reconciliation and peace. To be men and women of honesty and integrity in our dealings with others. We thank you too for the very beauty of creation which surrounds us here, for the opportunities that we have each day. And in your name now, we offer our prayers for others. We pray for our families and friends, wherever they may be this day, and ask for your blessing upon them, that they may know your ways and your peace and your joy. We pray for those whom we know by name and whom we know to be in need at this time. For any who have been bereaved in recent days and weeks, months or even years, who live now with that sense of absence. For those who are lonely or troubled or anxious. For those struggling with financial and economic circumstances. For any who are ill at home or in hospital and those who care for them. For those recovering from illness or treatment and sadly for those whose illness knows no cure. For them and for their families we ask the blessing of your peace and the touch, the healing touch of your Holy Spirit. We pray too for those in positions of power all in government, those in positions of responsibility and trust, 
that they might honestly, with integrity, reflect that trust which has been placed in them. And in their decision-making, put at its heart the values, the priorities of your kingdom. We remember, too, in our prayers, those whose lives today are so very different from our own. Those who are caught up in the midst of war and civil war and violence that so scar the beauty of this your world with the ugliness of human cruelty. The millions who presently live as refugees, their numbers added to each day. And we remember also in our prayers those who struggle this day will be with poverty and hunger, the result of failed crops and our inability to better share the rich resources of this, your world. We pray too for your church, with its different denominations, its different styles of worship, but given a unity not created by ourselves, but given by you, the unity of the very body of Christ. Save us from any sense of superiority. Help us to break down any barriers that divide us. Help us to better reflect that unity and harmony which is your desire for your church. And we pray too today for the work of the Gideon Society of Gideon International, for their ongoing work of bringing your word to people of all ages and different nations. May their work be blessed. And we remember too this day those sadly no longer with us, but whose love we were privileged to receive. May we never think them far away, for we share a fellowship with them still through the mystery of that fellowship and communion that we have in you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you the Father and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. We continue our worship with the giving of our offering. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your name we dedicate this, our offering, praying that it may be a symbol of our commitment to live in your ways and to work for the signs of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray together now and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hymn 182, now thank we all our God, hymn 182.
now go in peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day and always.